everyone and welcome to Harbor. We're so glad you're here with us, whether you're watching in person or online. My name is Catherine. And I'm Kylie. And one of the things that we looked for in a church family when we ended up plugging into Harbor was a place that gives us community. We believe very strongly that God calls us to community. And that's something that Harbor gave to us. Now let's get into the service. Good morning, Harbor Church. Would you stand and worship with us? We're so glad you're here with us this morning or watching online. I give you glory for all you've brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. And I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. service. I am so excited to have you guys back in this building. 
or if you're watching online, we haven't forgotten about you. Comment, say hey, let us know you're watching with us. Uh, we want to have a little bit of fun today. It's Super Bowl Sunday. I see a little bit of football representation in the crowd. Not as good as I would have expected, but we'll let it go. Uh, so we're going to play a little game this morning. We're going to have some Super Bowl trivia, but fear not. You do not have to know a single thing about sports or the Super Bowl to win this game. It is complete luck, completely random, my kind of game. You need no knowledge. Um, so here's the thing. The winner, first of all, of this prize, of this game, is going to win $50 to DJ's Wings to try to fund a little Super Bowl get-together get for you today. Um, and how it's going to work is I'm going to ask an either-or question. So I will say, you know, if you, what is my name? And it can be Katie or it can be Ron. And if you think it's Katie, you raise your hand. If you think it's Ron, you raise your hand. If we get it wrong, you got to sit down, and we'll keep going until we get down to one winner. Now, it's going to be the honor, honor system here because I can't keep track of all your hands. Keep the people next to you accountable. Do the right thing. We're in church, everybody. <laughs> all right, you guys get it? You with me? All right, let's give it a shot. So first question, how many people watched the Super Bowl in 2020? So last year, how many people do you think watched the Super Bowl? It's either 87 million or 102 million. So you think it's 87 million? Raise those hands. Let's see it. All right, all right. It's about half. All right, put them down. Who thinks it's 102 million? All right, correct answer is 102 million. So if you said 87, take a seat. We are weeding them out real fast. That's what I like to see. Just because you lost, you can still raise your hand. You just won't win anything, and you have to feel bad about yourself, but that's not on me. All right. Next up, how much did the most expensive Super Bowl ad ever cost? It was from Amazon. It was either 14.9 million or 16.2 million. Who thinks it was 14.9? See those hands? All right, all right, ooh, okay. All right, who thinks it was 16.2? Ooh, about half and half again. We're about to lose some people. 14.9 million. So 16ers take a seat. Hey, if you're online, keep participating. If you're answering questions, we won't know who's a winner, but we'll keep track. And if you're uh, staying involved, maybe we'll send you a little prize. All right, next up. This one's very personal to me. It means a lot. How many pounds of guacamole is consumed on average on Super Bowl Sunday? Either way, it's an insane amount. Four million or eight million? Who thinks it's four? Oh, boy, that's a lot. Okay, who thinks it's eight? All right, extra, extra guac wins out. It is eight million pounds. Ooh, what are we down to here? We got three left, is it just you three? Am I right on that? All right, so we have a first and second place prize, which means we're gonna go straight to our tiebreaker here. At the very end, if you'll bring up that tiebreaker question, Catherine. So here's the deal with this one. There's no hand raising. I'm gonna ask each of you to give your best guess. The answer is a number. Whoever's closest wins first prize. Second closest wins second prize, which is some money to Papa Gino's. Get yourself pizza. Everybody wins third place. Thanks for coming. Sorry, buddy. All right. <laughs> so your best guess, don't be embarrassed if you have no idea because nobody has any idea. The guesses have been wildly off. Um, how much money do you think each player on last year's losing Super Bowl team received? So they get a check just for showing up. They didn't win the game. How much do you think it's for? I'm going to bring it over here first. What's your best guess? Five million? Okay, what do you think? Half a million? Okay. 50,000. All right, you two are super generous. My friend over here is by far the closest, 62,000. We have our winner. Give that man a DJ's gift card. And Tracy, you come in second for five million. Oh, no, no, you do. I did this last service too. Half a million over here. Papa Gino's. Good work. You can take a seat. Let's give a hand to our winners. Get yourself some Super Bowl food today. Uh, Welcome, guys. I'm so glad you're here. If you're new, uh, my name is Katie. We do not do Super Bowl trivia every week, but we do like to have a good time. Uh, and if you're new, we want to give you a gift, even if you lost that game, just like most of you did. Um, so please let us know you're new here. You can scan that QR code on the back of some of the chairs or fill out a card if you grabbed it on the way in. Just let us know you're visiting. We'd love to send you something just to say thank you for coming, and we're glad you're here. Um, really quick, before we get back into worship, you may have noticed a bunch of backpacks and sleeping bags and blankets out in the lobby. Today is the last day to get in on our bags and blankets drive. Um, so if you've grabbed a backpack and filled it up, be sure to bring that back today. There's still time. Or you can bring a brand new blanket or sleeping bag. All of that this week is going to go right into the hands of people right here in Hyannis who do not have a place to call home, who are living on the streets or in the woods. And we want to do what we can to keep them warm. We know that snow is coming. Um, so please get in on that. Bring it back today. 
uh, by the end of the next service, and you'll be good to go. And then last but not least, we have Rooted coming up in a few weeks. Um, if you don't know what a Rooted night is, it's kind of a, a special night. We get together on a Sunday evening after church. Um, it's a bit of a chance for us to dig a little bit deeper than we get to uh, on a Sunday morning or a Thursday night. Um, we take communion together. We worship. It's a, it's a really unique time, and I'd really, really recommend if you call Harbor your home, if you consider this your church, please come. You do not want to miss it, but make sure you register. There is limited space that goes for you online folks as well. Uh, let us know you're coming. Save your spot. And that is all I've got for you guys. I'm going to have you get back on your feet. We're going to continue in worship, and Evan's going to tell you about a brand new song we're singing. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> Here at Harbor Church, we love the Word of God. And when we gather together in worship, the songs that we sing are always aligning themselves with what God says of himself in his word. And I'm going to read a quick passage for us this morning. It comes from the book of 1 Peter, written by Peter. And basically, he's writing to the church that's going through a difficult time. I think we could all agree the church is going through a difficult time today as well. And here's what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. All that God has done for us causes us to rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you guys, but when you've been through something, it changes your praise. When you're going through something, you need God desperately. You're crying out for him. And when you've been delivered from something, you want to shout. And so no matter where you are in that spectrum, if you're in here or if you're online, um, think about that as we sing this song. You may not know it, uh, but sing along with us as we teach it. And I'm going to teach you the beginning of that chorus here this morning. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's try that together. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. You could imagine. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages 
stepped out from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame we thank you jesus the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living hope let's sing that chorus together and hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living Seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me come on let's celebrate that then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me because jesus yours is the sounded beautiful thank you for singing with us let's pray man Jesus we thank you we thank you because of what you did over 2,000 years ago on our behalf through no merit of our own you gave up your life so we could walk in freedom that we could have life and that even in the midst of troubling times we can have hope because we know what you've done and we know what you've prepared for us in heaven we thank you, Lord, for that gracious gift. We ask that we would remember it, that even if we're going through something hard, whether that's here in this service or today online, that you would comfort our hearts, give us peace. We thank you, Jesus, and I pray all this in your name. Amen. You guys can be seated.
Well, good morning, Harbor Church. What's up? Make a little noise this morning. Hello to everybody online. Hope you guys are a little bit awake. Man, what an awesome set of worship that we got to have and, you know, playing a few games. We did a little bit of uh, Super Bowl fun this morning as we kind of j- jumping in. If you're watching online, thanks for tuning in. Um, if you're listening to this on the podcast, thanks for doing that as well. My name is Josh. I'm the pastor here at Harbor Church. If this is your first time in church or your first time in a long time, man, we're thrilled that you're with us. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. As you noticed, we were already playing some Super Bowl stuff. Who won the, uh, the, the free wings and the free pizza? Here, who got the, over here? I don't know if you guys know how it works, but when you're in church, you have to tithe. And uh, <laughs> in this case, it just means take your pastor out for wings or pizza. Um, but uh, I don't know if you guys are into the Super Bowl. I know we have a lot of people watching that are not from New England. And so I'm really, I'm really curious about today's uh, question. Um, and I know some of you are not into sports at all, and that's okay. No big deal. It's not going to be a sports message. But I did think uh, today would be a fun time to ask a sports-related question just to get you interacting. If you're online, I want you to type in your answer and play along so I can go back and see where it's at. But I know a lot of you watching online are in like different states, even different countries. I'm curious how you guys feel about the Super Bowl. Um, and, and normally I only give you two options. Today I'm going to give you three, and I want you to pick one of them, all right? So when it comes to the Super Bowl, do you want Tom Brady to win? Do you want Tom Brady to lose? Or do you not care? And I found this to be interesting because some people are like really like into this. The, uh, the Thursday night service, they wanted Brady to lose because they're like, that traitor, he left us, forget him. The first service was like, we want Tom Brady to win. We love him, even if he's wearing a different jersey, uh, which is why I'm wearing a, a Bucks jersey today. Um, you're just like, hey, it's, it's still our boy. We want him to win. And then there's a lot of people like, do not care. Uh, like the commercials are my favorite part of the Super Bowl. And that's fine. You can be in any one of those. Let's vote real quick. Those of you online, type in your answer. How many of you say, when it comes to the Super Bowl, I want Tom Brady to win? I'm, uh, see, some of you are pretty nice. How many of you say, I want Tom Brady to lose? I'm cheering for the Chiefs or him to lose. A few of you, there you go. I get that. And how many of you would say, I don't care? Okay, so a lot, a lot more evenly spread out in this service than in the first two. Well, I don't know if you're going to be happy or sad or whatever. Today, I don't have much to say on the Super Bowl. You obviously can tell where I'm going to be cheering, but uh, who knows how it's going to work out. Let's just hope that this, the snow coming in doesn't knock out our power and we actually get to watch the game. Um, <clears throat> that's really all I'm going for. Um, but uh, today's message is not about... Uh, sports or the Super Bowl. It's finishing up our series, uh, what we call Refocus. And uh, this is a series we've done for the last few weeks. And um, it's been a really fun series. Today is the end of that series. Next week, we're going to be kicking off a brand new series I'm really excited about. I should give you a little sneak preview. This is going to be fun. I've been saving this up for months, and uh, I'm really looking forward. Every week, we're going to do something a little special. And uh, this is going to talk about how we interact with people, the words we use, the stuff we say, how much our mouth gets us in trouble. So there might be somebody that you would like to invite to this series, and uh, it might be beneficial. It definitely kicked my butt as somebody who talks before he thinks. This is, a, this is a series for me, but it also talks a lot about our relationships and how God uses us. So that's just a little plug for starting next week. Um, come back and check that out. For today on Refocus, what we're talking about is the opposite of last week. Now, the last couple of weeks, we weren't able to meet in person, so we only met online. I hope you watch those messages online. And last week, we talked about a guy named Gehazi. And Gehazi is a servant who, you know, as much as he got to hang around with Elisha, he ends up missing the big picture. And at the end of Gehazi's life, he screws up. And when he gets confronted about it, he lies. He ends up being cursed with leprosy. And the end of the story is he goes off and dies from leprosy. And we don't really get to see a lot of his, his hindsight. And so I thought today we could end where we actually get to look at somebody reflecting on their own mess up all the other stories we've had good and bad whether it was a miracle from God or a screw up we've just kind of we've we've kind of taken our best guess at what they would have been thinking and that's how you and I were learning from some of these stories today we're going to actually look at somebody who screws up and then looks back on their screw up and what their hindsight is on their own thing. So we can actually see somebody's hindsight today, which I'm really excited about. I want to give you a, just a, a couple clips from it because it's, it's pretty powerful. Maybe you've heard of this person. Maybe you've heard of this screw-up. 
But this was their response. Let me give you a quote. One of their responses was this. I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. That's a direct quote from the Bible where this person responds to messing up. Now, I, I was looking at that. I was thinking, man, maybe that's like Judas or somebody. I mean, there's some, been some rebellious people do some screw-ups. Maybe that's Judas. This is The same person said this a little bit later. And they're talking to God. This is a part of their prayer. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. This is a begging, somebody pleading not to, not to lose out on their relationship with God. Anybody got any ideas on who we might be talking about? If you're on, uh, at home online, you can type in your guess. Who do you think we might be talking about? Who would have said this? What would be some things? Just say, shout out some answers. Okay, I heard a couple Davids. You are right if you guess David. It, there's a lot of people it could have applied to, but David is actually the one who is quoted as saying this stuff. And this is his response to a screw-up that he has with a woman named Bathsheba. Now, if you don't know who David is, that's okay. David is a very famous king in the Old Testament. He, he goes down in history as probably the most famous king of all of, uh, of, all of Israel's history. Uh, very famous because as a shepherd boy, just a scrawny little kid, he's the only one who's willing to step out on the battlefield and take on a giant. He takes on a nine-foot-plus giant named Goliath. That's where you get the phrase David versus Goliath. And it's this idea of a, a little underdog taking on a big dog and winning. And it's a, really, it's a really cool story. And that's what, if most people have heard of David, that's the story they've heard of. Well, if they've heard of a negative story, David has a few mess-ups. But for the most part, David does a really, really good job pursuing God, loving God, honoring God. He has a rough life. Even after he kills the giant and he becomes a leader in the army, he, the, the king, King Saul, gets so jealous of David that he turns him into a fugitive and, and casts him out and says that he's actually, he, he's actually a traitor to Israel, even though he wasn't. And so David has to go run for his life and hide in caves and in the countryside just because the king is so jealous of him. Eventually, that king dies, and David becomes king. And then, as much as he does some really great stuff, David has a royal, royal screw-up. Some people have heard this story, and it takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 11. David is out walking around on his palace, and his, his palace was higher up than all the rest of the, the home, so he could look down on all the, the homes that are around him. And one time while he's walking around, he looks out, and he sees a woman on the top of her house, bathing which that's where they would have done that but he's watching her and she's naked and she's beautiful and he's like i want some of that and then he finds out that is married to one of his men named uriah so this is another man's wife and uriah is not just any guy uriah is one of david's inner circle he's one of his mighty men uriah was a very faithful godly man somebody who loved david and loved israel and was 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 very honorable David says, I still want her. So he still takes this other man's wife. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant. And then when he finds out she's pregnant, he's like, crap. He gets Uriah to come home from battle and tries to get Uriah to go sleep with his wife so he can, you know, convince Uriah, to kind of fool Uriah that that baby was his. And then David would be done with it. But Uriah won't do that. Uriah is, is so con convicted that his friends and his, his men and his fellow soldiers are or off fighting. He wasn't going to come home and party. He, was, he, he wanted to be a part of what was going on with their struggle. So he, David can't get him to do that. So David decides to have him murdered. David has one of his own faithful men, a guy named Uriah, murdered. He has him go to the front line and then has the rest of the army pull back without Uriah knowing about it. And the enemy kills Uriah. And that's David's way of fixing his problem. After Uriah is dead and gone, David marries Bathsheba and she has her baby, and he's like, I'm good. Here's a couple of things that I noticed, and the reason I want to talk about this, my, I want you to hear me today. My goal is not to have a church service where I point my finger at you, and you're like, oh, shame me into bad stuff. I already know you're a screw-up, okay? You and I have messed up a lot. I want us to identify and figure out what it is we can do to learn from our screw-ups, because if we're going to refocus, God, what do you want me to see in 2021? It might be that he's, tr he's trying to show us something from some of our screw-ups that we can learn from. Learn how not to screw up again. Learn how to be better than what it was. If you're here and your screw-up is a sexual sin, 
It might be that you've committed adultery like David. It might be that you've done something pretty bad or had something bad happen to you in that department. Then if, you've, if that's happened, what can you learn from that? Don't just bury it. Learn from it. Maybe you've ruined a marriage. Okay, your last marriage didn't work out. What are you going to learn from it so that your, your next one or your current one is actually one that pleases God? See, you and I are so happy just to get past something bad that we don't stop and go, God, what, what was it that I did wrong and what can I do better? We just don't want to ever think about it. Maybe your thing isn't a sexual sin. Maybe it's something you've mismanaged in your finances. Maybe it's a, it's a way that you, that you prioritize the wrong things. Maybe it's a relationship that you burned. Maybe it's somebody that hurt you or that you hurt them. I can't guess at all of it, but you and I here have multiple failures that we can learn from if we'll learn from them. Okay, yes. Some of you are like, I don't want to think about it. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm trying to get you to understand. If you've never had one of these major failings from David, recognize that if you're still breathing, there's still an opportunity for you to really fall off of your high horse. David was cruising as the man of God. David was awesome. He was doing everything right. And then in one day, he just goes down. Because it just takes one moment. It takes one time of pursuing the wrong things. Now, a lot of us, and I'll put myself in this category, our screw-ups are because we're stupid. Shake your heads yes, because I'm not the only one in here that's stupid. We do stupid things, and, we, and a lot of it, and we can blame it on our youthfulness, like, oh, when I was young, I just didn't know any better. And it's dangerous to be stupid. It is, because we do a lot of damage just from not thinking. I shared with you guys a couple months ago one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein. I'm going to share it with you again. It's very dangerous. Ignorance is very dangerous. Or one of the most, da- one of the most uh, dangerous things is ignorance. But the only thing that's worse than that is arrogance. The only thing that's more dangerous than being stupid is the arrogance that says, I know this is a bad idea, but I'm, I'm okay. I can handle it. David doesn't fall because he's stupid. I mean, you could argue there are some stupid choices he makes. But David wasn't ignorant of Bathsheba's consequences. He knew that was another man's wife. He, in his, in his entitlement, I'm the king. I'm the, I'm the giant slayer. I got this. When you begin to think that you can handle sin, even though other people can't, your arrogance, your ignorance, your entitlement will put you in a place where you are going to fall and fall hard. Just because, and this is what I hear from people all the time. Yeah, I just, I figured I could handle it. I talk to people who are suffering from addictions, whether it's pills or needles or uh, alcohol or whatever. I thought I could handle it. You know that a lot of other people fall, but when you start taking it, you're like, yeah, I'm not like them. I can handle it. I can get, I can pull myself out. I can stop anytime I want. When you watch other people at work abandon their family to pursue a better paycheck and you begin to worship and idolize money you think i'm not going to be like everybody else i can balance it i can pursue that idol and i won't fall victim to it when you watch other people flirt with co-workers and you're like yeah i won't screw up my marriage i'll just have a little fun but it won't be that big a deal you begin to think i can do these things and it won't affect me it won't hurt me you're in, y- y- your arrogance is leading you towards trouble and a lot of you, I, I, I'm not, once again, if you've already screwed up and this is in the rearview mirror, then you should be shaking your head yes, because there's people in the room right now, or there's people watching that they haven't screwed up and they're falling victim to this in their own mind. If you've already screwed up, learn from it. Like, hey, why did I screw up? Yeah, I, I really just wasn't protected enough. I really didn't have the safeguards. I got cocky. I thought I could handle it. I allowed certain people extra access to my life that I shouldn't have. You can, you can help the other people because there's people in here right now that haven't, and they're like, nah, he's talking about weaker people than me. No, I'm not. I'm talking about you. Here's the thing about David. He saw something, lusted after something, and then went after it because as great as David was, as much as he was a man after God, he still had a flesh. He still had a sin nature, and all of us have a sin nature. You were born a sinner. You were born already knowing how to lie. Nobody taught you how to lie. Nobody taught you how to be greedy or selfish. Nobody had to teach you how to lust after somebody. That's inside of you already. And here's the reason I bring that up. is because the world 
gives us this, this stupid line, and we fall for it hook, line, and sinker. We think, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I've watched people print it out from Pinterest and put it on like a fancy board in their house. And they're like, ah, sweet. It's like whatever the heart wants, pursue it. Just if you want it, go for it. I watch that, and man. Mm. Here's what it says in Mark chapter 7. This is Jesus talking, by the way. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. <clears throat> from within, <coughs> excuse me, from within, out of a person's heart, inside of you, that's where all the evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. You see that list? He says that comes from inside of you. We like to think all those things are exterior and they're influences from the outside. That's in your heart. He says, all these vile things come from within. They're what defile you. The very first line was from within, from a person's heart. See, Jesus and his disciples were eating and the, the spiritual people were mad that they hadn't done a, a, a proper cleansing ritual. And Jesus is like, yeah, it's good to wash your hands, but you guys are so consumed with the law of washing your hands that you don't know that your heart is what really needs to be washed. The inside of you is the more dirty than the outside of you. We like to focus on the outside. Let me make the outside look good, and then people think I'm all good. David on the outside looked great, but on the inside, he just looked and lusted and said, I'm going to take. See, what happens, guys, is we allow our heart to dictate what we should do. We allow ourselves to be the higher, higher standard. If, if we judge that we're okay with it, then we're okay with it. If you do that, when you're driven by your desires, you're destined for destruction. This is something I want you to remember from David's life. If you haven't learned this lesson already, then learn it now so that you don't fall into it. If you are driven, if you allow your actions to be dictated by what you feel and what you want, your emotions are going to betray you. Your heart has an innately wicked, fleshly, sinner's center in it. I'm not saying that you're this horrible person. I'm saying that you are not good enough to judge everything going forward. You have to have a standard better than yourself. Because even though you might be a good person, in a moment of weakness, you'll be like, yeah, I think that's okay. Just me? Just a whole room full of liars today? Hope somebody online is like, yeah, you're right, Pastor, amen, because nobody in here is doing that. We, we don't like to admit there's a lot of dumb things I did that in the moment I convinced myself it was okay. I think that's okay. I think I can get away with that. See, here's the thing. David thinks he gets away with it. David's like, well, Uriah's dead. He marries Bathsheba. That's, by the way, one of eight wives that he has. She's like, she's married, kid. We're good. All over. Let's keep going on. I screwed up, but I hit it, and nobody's ever going to find out about it. I'm good. Except for, God sends a prophet to tell David a story. Now, back in the day, the king would often hear about crimes or events that were happening in his kingdom. And the king was the ultimate judge, jury, and executioner. So it wasn't uncommon for the king to hear about things that were going on and be asked to rend, you know, uh, render a verdict. It says in the next chapter that Nathan shows up in verse number 1. Nathan, the prophet, God sends him to tell David a story. And the story that Nathan tells him is this. Hey, boss, <clears throat> there's two men in a certain town. And one of them's rich and one of them's poor. And the rich man owns a lot of sheep and cattle, has a lot of livestock. The poor guy, he only has one little lamb that he bought. He raises this lamb. He grew, grew up with his kids and eats from his own plate and drinks from his cup. He cuddles with it like a, like a baby. This guy's got one little sheep and he brings it inside and loves this sheep like nobody's business. And then it says, one day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. And the custom would be, if somebody's coming, you take one of your own, slaughter it, and make a big fancy meal out of it. Well, the rich man, instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David hears this, all right, and is furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. Huh. Oh, yeah, we can see how stupid David is. Isn't it amazing when you're right in the middle of sin that you can become really self-righteous? 
as surely as the Lord lives. Now he's going to bring God into it because he's, he's good, right? As surely as the Lord lives. Boy, how quick it is, how easy it is for those of us that are in sin to find fault in somebody else. When you, and listen, when you find it really easy to find faults in other people, it might be that's your defense mechanism for covering up the sin in your own life. Some of you could teach a master's course on pointing out other people's issues. You are very, very good at looking at somebody and going, that's wrong with her, that's wrong with her, that's wrong with him, he, he does that. And you can find all of it. Because when we have sin in our own life, that's something that we do. We quickly find stuff in other people. It makes us feel better about ourselves. David does it. And he's about to get caught. You ever get caught? Like red-handed caught? Like, can't deny that you got caught caught? I remember as a kid, a little kid, uh, my mom told me not to touch this cactus. I think I was like four years old, right? And they had this little cactus. I think it was actually my grandma's cactus. It was in a planter. And it was one of the little small ones with thousands of little, like, little you know, prick, prickles on it or whatever you call them. And she's like, don't touch that. And I'm like, she goes away probably like five, ten minutes later. Ah! Ah! Comes out. Josh, what's wrong? Ah! As, I, as I was told, it's hundreds and hundreds of needles stuck in my hand from that cactus. Ah! Josh, did you touch the cactus? <laughs> you might be lying, son. You might be lying. Literally caught you. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty obvious. And it doesn't matter how obvious sometimes we, we like to lie. Like last week, Gehazi, the servant who just blatantly lies when he's caught in the middle of it. Here's David getting caught. He goes, that rich man deserves to die. I swear to God, that guy deserves to die and should pay back at least four times. That's David's judgment on the hypothetical or what was used as a metaphor for himself, rich man. He doesn't realize it until the very next verse where Nathan goes, Nathan said to David, you are that man. Can you imagine that moment where David's like, that guy is the worst of the worst. And Nathan goes, aha, you're that guy, bro. You're the rich man. You're the screw up. You done messed up, eh, Aaron? This is you. You did it. And David must have been like, Wow. Walked right into that. You're the man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. God knows what you did, David. He's the one that gave you the power to sit on that throne. God put you there, and you had the arrogance to think that you somehow got it yourself. And that everything was coming to you. Like you deserved any woman you wanted, you arrogant idiot. And David, oh, what do we learn from David getting caught? A couple of things. I see David quick to judge that rich man. Quick to look down his nose, doesn't he? That rich guy taking that poor guy's lamb, I would never do that. I'd take another guy's wife, but I would never take another guy's lamb. That's what's happening. See, when you and I are in sin, when we're, when, we're, when we're down a path where we're sinning against God, we begin to hide it and cover it up and all that stuff, we find that it's easier to look down your nose than to look in the mirror. And this is something that a lot of you need to check yourself. I have to check myself on this quite a bit. When you find it very easy to look down your nose and find a problem with everybody else, but never find a problem with yourself, it's probably because you're hiding sin. It's probably because you're not willing to admit that you are as broken as they are or worse. That rich guy taking that poor guy's lamb. I swear, that guy deserves to die. Really, David? You're going to pass that judgment? On the drive here, I am driving behind somebody going, what is their problem? They are so slow. I've got to be somewhere. Let's go. And I'm sure they're sitting there going, what is his problem? Riding on my tail like this. Like, ah, you know what? You know, and I'm, we can only see why each other is broken. 
Not that I'm a jerk for tailgating or not that they're a jerk for going really slow. <laughs> Neither of us see that we did anything wrong, but we absolutely can see the fault in other people, right? Right? Some of you should elbow the person you're sitting next to. This is what Galatians chapter 6, verse number 4 says. Pay careful attention to your own work. Worry about yourself. For then you can find satisfaction for a job well done. You won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Worry about yourself. If you spend as much time finding the issues that you need to work on as you do noticing and complaining about the issues of everybody else, your life will be so much better. You're not, read this verse backwards, deconstruct it. You will not find satisfaction as long as you continue to compare yourself to other people. You can, be, you can finally reach that contentment when you say, God, this is how you made me. Help me work on me. There's a story in the Bible where a guy has got a, a two-by-four sticking out of his eyeball, and he's trying to take sawdust out of somebody else's eye. And the irony there is like, are you stupid? Worry about your own issue. Walking around with a telephone pole sticking out of your face, trying to get somebody else to get a speck out of theirs. You got plenty of issues you can deal on your own. But we don't ever like to see that. We, we don't like looking in the mirror. We don't like taking a hard look at where we're jacked up. We just like to notice everybody else's. Here's another thing that I see from him. He doesn't recognize his own issues until he sees himself in the story as the rich man. See, he has to, he has to spend some time thinking about what that, that poor man with the one sheep had to feel like. And then he had to see what that rich man arrogantly did. And when he began to see it from their shoes, that's when he realized how messed up he was. So here's, what I'm, here, here's like the take-home lesson for you if you're going to practice something this week. Sometimes changing your perspective is what changes your attitude. And I want you to try this because some of you are having some issues Maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's at your work, maybe it's with your parents or a teacher or a classmate, maybe it's, maybe it's with a coworker or a friend, maybe it's with your kids, your grandkids. We don't like to see things from anybody's perspective but our own. Don't they know how tired I am? Don't they know how hard I've worked? Don't they know what I'm going through? Why are they asking me to do this? Why are they fighting me on this? Why are they acting like this? Do they not realize what I have to deal with? And when you can only see things from your perspective, you will constantly find yourself the victim and everybody else the bad guy. And when everybody else is the bad guy, you're never going to be at peace with them. You're never going to love them the way that God's called you to love them. You're not going to pray for them the way God's called you to pray for them. When my wife and I are at odds, it's very easy for me to be annoyed. Like, what is her problem? Can't, can't, she's got to get on board. Let's go. Why do I, man, why, why is she just being so hard-headed about this? But then I stop and have to see things from her perspective. She has to put up with me. <laughs> God help her. She should be a saint. <laughs> when you stop and look at what, what the other person has to deal with in your attitude, in your bad habits, in your issues, maybe your boss isn't as much of a jerk as you think they are. They have to deal with an employee like you. And most of the time you're like, oh, I'm really good. Well, you're also a pain in the butt. And maybe your kids, maybe you wouldn't be as frustrated with your mom or your dad if you knew what they were having to deal with to take care of you. Mom, dad, grandparents, maybe that son, daughter, or grandkid, you could have a little bit more patience when you realize some of the struggles they're going through right now. What if you stopped and put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're most annoyed with right now, most angry with, most disappointed in? Does it make them perfect? But what if it just softened you a little bit? Jesus was perfect, and yet he constantly had compassion for all the people around him. Even the people that were abusing him. Even the people that only wanted to use him for his powers. He still loved them. This is what the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3. It says in verse number 8, Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Find some empathy in your life. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Why don't you try being tender-hearted and humble? You do that, you don't look down your nose at everybody. 
You go, man, they have it hard. I may not even know what kind of day they went through. They didn't say hi to me when I said hi to them on the way into work. So now I want to be mad at them, think they're a jerk. But I don't know what they went through this morning. I don't know the phone call they just got off of. I don't know what the ride into work was like. I don't know what kind of childhood they had. Maybe the people that you're most mad at, if you had walked in their shoes, you would have a lot more patience, a lot more time for. I, I think we see that from David. He sees his own sin in that situation because he changed his perspective. You and I changing our perspective with different people. Try it this week. See if God doesn't soften your heart for somebody. Try to see it from their view. I want to end on this, though. I read to you from the beginning, at the beginning of this passage, David is, is looking on his sin with Bathsheba, and he, he said those things that I quoted to you earlier. God, I feel, I feel so heavy. I, I can just feel the weight, feel my guilt. God, don't abandon me. This is David's hindsight. We don't get to see this normally. Psalms 51 is a written account of David's feelings about screwing up with Bathsheba. This is how David responds to his sin. I am not teaching you this message today because I want you to go, oh, I feel so guilty, pastor just shamed me. No, I want you to recognize that like David, you can fall from the mountaintop all the way down to the deepest, darkest valley, and yet there is still hope. Watch this. Psalms 51, David's response to getting caught in his sin of, let's just remember, adultery, well, lust, and then adultery, and then lying, and then murder. That's a lot of sins to compile. Maybe you're guilty of all of those and then some, or maybe you're not as bad. But it doesn't matter. One sin, one sin, and you've put distance between you and the perfect God. So don't look down your nose on David because you haven't sinned as much as him. And don't look at yourself as irredeemable because you've screwed up more than him. One sin and you were all in the same boat. We're distant from a God who is perfect. This is what David says. Verse number one. Have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me, clean me from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. In the middle of the worst sin that he had ever created, in the middle of the worst thing he'd ever done, in this distance that he had fallen, he fell so far from being the man who was walking with God and hearing from God and doing what he was supposed to do. And then in just a quick turnaround, he screws up royally. Can you imagine being in that place where you're like, I used to be, I used to be good. Now I'm a murderer. I'm so broken. You and I, when we fall, we're tempted because a lot of times Satan tells us this. You're too far gone. God can't fix you. You should be too embarrassed. Look how far you've fallen. Look what you used to be and now where you're at. God's got no hope for you. There's no redemption for you. There's no coming back from this. Your case is hopeless. I want you to see verse number one. He says, have mercy on me, O God. Why? Because your love never fails. Your unfailing love. Hear me. Listen, those of you online, I'm done. This is it. Psalm 51 is the redemption story. This is how you refocus. You need to understand that no matter where you're at today, God can be a part of your picture. No matter how bad it's been, God's got you. You can never fall so far that God can't pick you up. You need to hear that because some of you are believing the lie that Satan is telling you that you're too far from God's grace. His mercy, his power, his love, and his forgiveness covers the worst of the worst of the worst. He died to pay for your sin. The thing that you're feeling so convicted by, the thing that you feel so broken by, 
The thing that you think keeps you disqualified from his love is the very reason he stretched out his arms on the cross and said, nail it to me. Because the consequences of sin is heaviness. The brokenness that comes when we screw up is that guilt and that shame and that regret and the things that were done to us and the things that we have done to others, they, they weigh on us and they pull us down and they make us feel so dirty and so incomplete. And so what we do is we go, no, no, I can't, I can't, God, I can't. And he said, no, that's why I died. I didn't do anything wrong, but I know that everything wrong causes something. It costs shame, it brings pain. And so put that on me, give me her pain. Give me his guilt. Give me her shame. Give me that depression. Give me that anger. Put it on me. I want to take it so you don't have to feel it. Whoever is listening to me today, understand the God of the universe loves you so much that no matter how far you've fallen, he will reach down into that dumpster fire and pull you out. He will clean you off no matter how dirty you are because what he wants more than anything is he wants you to be restored. That's why he paid for all that sin. You don't have to feel that today. David goes on, he says this. Against you and you alone have I sinned. See, that doesn't make sense when you think, well, he sinned against Bathsheba. He definitely sinned against Uriah. See, what he understood was all of what he's done and all of what you and I have done that's wrong puts us at odds with a God who's perfect. And so your real sin today is against your creator. He says, I've done what's evil in your sight. You'll be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. You see, David, David has to own it before he can let go of it. You have to own it. You have to be willing to admit that it's your fault. You and I aren't good at this. We have a lot of reasons why we screwed up, don't we? Well, if they had been better, if my parents had treated me better, I wouldn't be the way I am today. If I just made more money, I wouldn't have the greed or I wouldn't steal. If, if my spouse had paid more attention to me, I wouldn't have gone to somebody else. If, 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 this had, if, if I looked better or had a better background, I wouldn't be so, so into this sin. We have a million reasons why it's somebody else's fault. David could have said, God, forgive Bathsheba for, for taking that bath and tempting me. He can't blame her. He has to blame himself. What you need to understand, by the way, this works with God, and this also works with the people in our lives. A true, re, a true confession requires genuine admission. Don't go to somebody and tell them you're sorry that something else happened. Tell them you're sorry for what you did. Own it. Take responsibility. Some of you have asked for forgiveness, but you've never taken responsibility. I screwed up. I did something wrong. You don't have to answer for what somebody else did. They have to answer to God for what they did. You have to answer for your response. What you thought, what you said, what you did. That's on you. He says in verse 7, purify me for my sins. If you want to know a prayer to pray, these five verses are the prayer that you should pray. Purify me for my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. I love this. Oh, give me back my joy again. God, you've broken me. Remember, today isn't about being broken and staying there. You might need to be broken, but once you've been broken, once you come to that realization that you're the screw up, that you messed up and you repent, he says, you've broken me. Now let me rejoice. I've admitted it. I see my mistakes. I look back. I see where I went wrong. I see what I did. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. You see what you guys are missing out on? God does not want you walking around in shame and guilt. That's a consequence of sin. The ramifications of your sin is a lot of the damage that it does to you and your family. The consequences is that guilt and shame. 
But God doesn't want you to live in that darkness. He wants you to rejoice. He wants you to have a joy. Here's the thing that David's prayer of repentance teaches us. It's that sin and joy don't coexist. Sure, there's a little bit of fun in sin for a season. But it's going to leave you dark. It's going to leave you empty. And what God has for you is joy. I like the way David says it. The joy of your salvation. God, I need to be happy again. I want to sing praises again. God, help me. God, save me. Some of you are missing out on joy. You haven't had real joy, real happiness in a long time. Let go of the buried sin. Confess that. You, if, if you confess it and hand it over to God, then you can hand all of the consequences. So you can hand it off and go, I, I, I committed this thing. I'm giving it to you, God. And here's the guilt that comes with it. And here's the shame that comes with it. And here's the regret that comes with it. And here's the bitterness that comes with it. I'm giving it to you, God. I don't have to carry that anymore. Why would you have to pay for something that he already paid for? And give it to him. Find some joy today. Find some joy today. Find a reason to rejoice today. You can't have that if you're hanging on to your sin. You can let go of that today, and you can find what David found. David goes down in history as a man after God's heart, even after his screw-up, because he repented, and he got back right with God. Doesn't mean he still didn't have consequences from his sin, but he didn't have to walk around in that darkness. He found joy again, and you can too. Let's pray together. As I pray out loud, would you pray right where you're at, whether you're watching online or you're in here, what would God have for you today? What would God have for you? If you're in here and you've never invited God into your life, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to take away your sin, do that for the first time, that's called salvation. To genuinely trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to give him all of your mistakes, all of your screw-ups, all of your sin, invite him into your life and, and, and make that a personal decision right now. It can be like David's prayer or it could just be something similar where you have a heart that says, God, I want you to call the shots. I want you to be the one in control. Forgive me and help me. Pray that. And as I pray out loud, you pray right there at your seat. And as, as people are praying around you right now, some of you that have already accepted Jesus Christ, what you need to do is you need to ask him for that joy. You need to ask him for that excitement. Maybe it's because you've been looking down your nose at other people. Maybe it's because you've been acting entitled. Maybe it's because you've, you've gotten to a place where you think that you're better and you can ask for forgiveness of that today. Whatever it is that God might have pricked your heart about, just ask him, God, forgive me. Give me a joy. As I pray, you pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for who you are and what you've given us. God, thank you for the story of David. Thank you for the story of David and what it means for us to, to know you better and draw closer to you. God, help us. Help us learn that we, we don't know what's best, that you know what's best for us. God, forgive us of, of the times that we, in our arrogance, think that we, we have the best plan. Forgive us for the way we act towards people, the way we think about things, the way we hold on to our sin and our shame. God, forgive us and restore to us a joy and excitement. God, be with the person right now under the sound of my voice that needs to invite you into their life for the very first time that needs to find salvation in the arms of Jesus. God, help that person to make that choice, to surrender to you, to find the forgiveness that only you can offer, and to give you the, the, the opportunity to, to be the one in charge of their life. God, I pray that each and every one of us would make that decision and that we would stay close to you. It's in your name that we ask all of this. Amen. I want to thank you guys so much for leaning in.